Today I show you about fiber optic cables. They look like this one. And why you shouldn't do this with a fiber optic cable. Everyone knows you shouldn't do that, but why? Well, I have here a, a HP loss meter that is made to measure power loss in uh, fiber optic connections and cables. It is now set to zero, uh, zero decibels. We, are, we have an output, we have an input and the meter measures what comes uh, from the output back to the input and we are now at zero decibel so it's a normal loss of that cable so of course it has a certain loss but we have zeroed that and if I start bending the cable you will see the loss of optical energy will be bigger. We have one turn now, very narrow turn. It already has minus 0.3 decibel. Two turns, 0.4. So more, so I narrow the turns, I pull it tight, minus 0.5. And the more I uh, bend the cable, the more I squeeze it, the more loss we have, which sounds logic, but well, why is it? So one decibel, it's quite a lot of loss here. And if I straighten the cable back, if I straighten it, uh, remove all those curves and loops we go back to my normal so why where is the light going we lose light so it must be going somewhere and that I will show you right now this is my super duper high-end uh, fiber optic cable holder and my green laser. I took a green laser because it's the most powerful laser I have. The red lasers I have are a little bit weak. You can see the light coming out from the end of the fiber. It makes a weird pattern on the table because the fiber is just broken. It's not a clean cut. I think the surface of that looks perhaps like the Swiss mountains in a small scale. There is the plastic uh, protection for the fiber. I stripped that too. Then we have a lot of Kevlar fibers here. They are from uh, stretch. Uh, they are to protect from from stretch and then the outer uh, hull. Uh, if you need some Kevlar fibers, you just get some old fiber cables and you have it. Now, as you can see, the light exits at the end of the fiber, but the fiber itself seems also to glow. This is because uh, much of the light is uh, reflected at the end, because it's not a clean cut. When we touch the water drop here, uh, the water drop is, uh, becomes uh, uh, lights up, and less of the uh, light is reflected back into the fiber. This is because the, reflect, uh, the refraction index of the water is, is much closer to the refraction index of the glass. So the transition from the glass to the water is much smoother than from the glass to air. Now we will see what happens if we bend that fiber. Again, some of the light is reflected. If I touch it with my fingers, it uh, also removes that reflection a little bit. And uh, when I start to bend it, you will see that the light suddenly 
leaves the fiber and the loop here lights up. So that is because the, uh, the reflection inside the fiber or better the light is reflected in an angle where it is possible to leave through the fiberglass to the side walls of the fiber and the tighter you make that bend the more light will be lost and the loss also continues after the bend because the the angle of the light is altered in the band and then it it continues to move uh, in that angle. I will make a sketch uh, in a few seconds to explain that a little bit better. So just enjoy the light show here. Here I try to break that. It's broken now. As you saw, uh, it needs a very tight radius to break, to actually break the fiber. Here you can see uh, the fiber with the plastic uh, mantle around it. Uh, this mantle is a little bit translucent and it uh, distributes the light a little bit, so it can be seen even better at that point. You see, I bend, it lights up, I straighten it, it goes out. Well, let's see how a fiber is made. It has two layers of uh, different types of glass. It has an outer layer, which is made of uh, sil uh, silicon dioxide, and the inner layer with made of silicon dioxide and some uh, doping materials mostly uh, phosphorus or uh, germanium uh, that changes the refraction refraction index of the glass and if you have two layers with different refraction indices, indices the light will uh, be reflected at this uh, layer. Now uh, if the light sh comes in at the right angle it will be reflected up and down uh, for the entire length of the cable but if it comes in a too uh, steep angle some of the light will leave the, the fiber and that is exactly the effect uh, that you saw. Now, when we bend the fiber, this is uh, a bent fiber, the outer core, the mantle, uh, it's only... So we get some strange angles here, some uh, more pointed angles and more light leaves the fiber through that layer. And then at the end of the fiber we have the inner core and uh, the outer mantle. My break here somehow like the Swiss mountains as I said the light comes straight on and then is reflected in all kind of directions by this uneven surface, some of the light comes out, some of the light will be reflected back and because of the weird angles it has, uh, some of the light even leaves the fiber. That is what you said. And now we come with our drop of water that evens out this, uh, this border, this and uh, it makes something like a smooth surface and more light is coming out of the fiber and only a tiny amount will be reflected. So you see it is important for a fiber optic connector to have a polished surface. 
and because the video would be a little bit short and this uh, loss test set here from HP is not working correctly anyway I think I will do a little teardown on it uh, it has a couple of problems so first of it if you turn it on it does not initialize sometimes it jumps on when you push the light button a few times or any other button but it seems not today um, I when I made the, the video with the, with the fiber um, I hooked it up to my power supply and uh, supplied 7 instead of 6 volts and it seems that worked after a while so I didn't uh, turn it off because I feared that it wouldn't come again and that's what's happening now so let's see what's inside first of all we have this protective cover here which can be removed like that it has this sort of slot and hole that connects to these buttons then I turn it off the next uh, um, the next thing that annoys me extremely you cannot open that bad okay now it works it's always like that if you want to show it to someone it's completely different so that's the first time it really opens like that without using a screwdriver because they have this very sharp uh, angle here that hooks into that place and uh, to remove it I don't know how, how uh, strong you have to push here but uh, I don't like it um, it says Hewlett Packard GmbH that means it could be manufactured in Germany because GmbH it's a typical German uh, abbreviation for companies it's like a, what is it LLC or something like that in English but it's made in Japan and I have the impression it doesn't look like HP at all so the, it's the 8140A test set it's from 1990 about that and it has oops, two modules here one input module it has a you can see indium gallium arsenide uh, photo detector maybe for a couple of wavelength this wavelength you can select with the button here wavelength select then we have an LED this is the, the output module it sends some light at 1300 nanometers which is in the infrared region has an adapter for the SC SC connector type there is the same adapter here okay I already removed the screws because I had to make it work somehow for the video so that's why I can open it like that it has uh, two screws here two screws up here and then you can remove the top cover which has this button uh, rubber 
button pad here and the slider switch. Um, there is something funny about here. There are two springs with it looks like a, a, a little metal bar inside, but it is glued on both sides. Uh, both sides. I don't know if perhaps they. Ah, okay. Now I see it. It's for the ejection sliders to eject the modules. There are sliders on the side. You push it, the module is ejected because you shouldn't pull on the um, on the connector here. It's uh, written in the manual. You shouldn't do that. But I think, well, it's strong enough to withstand that. But okay, they have an ejector button, so we will use it. There's a little plastic thingy. Let's see what's inside. Oops, I lost the screws. No problem. I won't put it together again. There are one screw here, another screw here. Here also Hewlett Packard GmbH serial number made in Japan. So it's funny to have that GmbH while it is made in Japan. So this is the input module, so it's a, a sensor. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm off the camera. It says PD302, that means photo detector. It has three pins, a lot of uh, adjustment potentiometers, which are siliconed to prevent any movement, and a nice connector on this side. Now the other one, oops, one screw here, one screw on the other side. Slide the cover off and we see LED 401, so it's some sort of LED, also one with three pins. I would guess the one pin goes to the case, that's just for uh, shielding, possibly. When you look at the diode symbol on the PCB, it's clear that these two pins are the diode. So we have some, I would say, some current uh, regulator with a silicon pot, some kind of operational amplifier, I guess, small transistor, can see what it is, what is it? LM305, ah, it looks like a voltage regulator, okay, that's that. Um, there is another screw, but I have already broken the plastic, as you can see, last time. Oops, there are two metal spacers. Now the, it's a two-board construction. Uh, to, to remove the lower board, you have to open these four screws here, but I won't do that. There is not much on the other side. So, what do we have here? Buttons. LCD. Uh, the LCD has a backlight, it's an electroluminescence backlight that connects through these connectors and comes, I don't know, possibly from that transformer here. That looks a bit like an inverter. So, what do we have? We have a Hitachi I would say it's the LCD driver, which makes sense. Then we have some sort of microcontroller, also Hitachi HD6301. 
Um, then we have a TSC 800 IJL. That's a analog to digital converter. Um, and as you can see on the date code 91. Then we have a digital to analog converter, a DAC8043. And then we have a OP270. I guess OP could be an operational amplifier. Then we have something from Bur from Burr Brown D thirty eight ten. It has a couple of legs, and one leg is tied to this post here, and then wired to that board, which is again wired to that post here, and that board. Oops, now I can break it, no problem. Oops, it has a lot of resistor stuff. I think it's some precision resistors and some chips. I can't see which one. It looks nice, it looks handmade. So I'd say that's some sort of voltage reference to the entire. Thing. Okay, maybe we can see what's underneath here. Let's bend it a little bit out of the way. Well, so I did all, I think I already changed uh, the, the calibration. So we have a 4051. It's a the CMOS, CMOS HC4051. CMOS, uh, I think it's a, it's a switch. I'm not sure, but could be an analog switch. And we have uh, another one here. Okay, it seems that is some sort of range switching. So we have analog switches here. CMOS switches and a couple of resistors and the common goes to that one the operational amplifier that's the switch it has two modes it, uh, one mode is uh, measuring what's what comes to the input so you can measure the absolute power of the light that comes in or you switch it over to loss then you measure, then you have uh, the source activated, go to a loop of uh, fiber uh, cable, come back and you can measure how much uh, light is lost. Well, um, that's about it. The connectors for the modules, very stable on an aluminium base, that's not too bad. The rest, well, uh, not too exciting, but yeah, that's it. Battery case, again, the whole thing. Okay, thanks for watching.